We light this candle to represent our grief. The pain of losing you is real. Reminds us of the depth of our love for you. Reminds us that our lives are now changed forever. Right there, boss. this candle we light to represent our courage, to confront our sorrow, to comfort each other, to trust in our community, and to grow in strength for tomorrow. This candle we light in your memory for the times that we've laughed, the times we've cried, the times we may have been frustrated with each other, the silly things that you would do, the beauty of your smile, the caring, and the joy that you gave us. Thanks, Dave. This candle is the light of hope. It reminds us of the memories of you that are ours now forever. May the glow of its flame be our source of hopefulness now and forever. Thank you. And this final candle we light for our love. We light this candle that your light will always shine. We cherish the special place in our hearts that will always be reserved just for you. We thank you for the gift that your living has brought to each of us. You are loved. You are remembered. Thank you. Well, my name is Reverend Philip Smith. It's my honor and my privilege to be your funeral celebrant today. As we bring our hearts and minds together to share in the love and the memories that you each have of Betty Marie Rennie. And on behalf of Betty's loving family, her loving and cherished partner and husband for their 69 plus years, her Ross, her wonderful children, Marilyn, Ross Jr., Paul, and Doug, and their partners, her loving grandchildren, Brandon, Michael, Jocelyn, Lauren, Courtney, Jason, Nicole, Melissa, and Natasha, and her beloved great-grands, Francis and Lucy, Brooke, Josie, Cameron, Ella, Denver, and Phoenix. I have a funny feeling somebody's a Four Christmases fan. <laughs> no, sorry, that was inappropriate. It was just in my mind. <laughs> Our memories today also encompass those who have shared love with Betty and have gone on before. Her loving parents, Hector and Gladys. Her brother Frank and his loving wife Beth, her sister Shirley and her in-laws Dorothy and Jack. All who have journeyed on before and are now reunited with Betty once more and for eternity. We thank you for joining us here today. 
There's an importance and a value found in the decision to come together, to bring your hearts together and to support one another and this family today to set apart this time and bring greater value to the celebration of this treasured life. And let's be clear today, some might see the gathering of souls to say goodbye as an extravagance. But today we gather for a life that's truly worth celebrating. This life that has been shared in the moments and memories created within it and through it and those interactions that you've all been a part of. It will all become the part of the fabric of your own lives and your own memories as you continue to knit it into your days and the days to come. And some may be here simply supporting others that were a part of this circle and love that was Betty's life. Yet together, we all celebrate this well-lived life and learn the ways in which she has touched and enhanced her world together today. Our role now becomes the keepers of this legacy the one that was lived and created by Betty. As we move about our lives beyond today, we need to hold dear the example that her life has given us to follow. And we need to do so effectively. The family has asked today that we share some words of scripture, and so I've chosen the 23rd Psalm because I felt it might be in keeping with one that would reside in Betty's heart. The psalmist writes these words, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters, and he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. And surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. With these words of hope in mind, let me invite several of the voices that shared in the love that was Betty to come and there, share their thoughts of her with us today. We'll hear from her granddaughters today, Courtly, oh, sorry, Courtney, Jocelyn, and Lauren. And I will, no, somebody's waving me off there. Brandon's going to speak. Was that a false start on my part? I apologize. I think somebody told me this, didn't they? It's okay. So all the weight is on your shoulders today? You look like you can handle it, buddy. I'm going to invite you to come forward and share your thoughts of Grandma with us today. Yeah, now. So, well, as recommended, I keep things brief, but it's, uh, it's quite happy to be able to speak to everyone all at once. Uh, I'll try my best. Yesterday, my sisters and I, we were recollecting memories of uh, Grandma Betty, and we knew our grandmother had a habit of telling us a story uh, repetitively over and over again. But Jocelyn had something to suss out, which was that um, the story Grandma had told her uh, on repeat was that was the one of her becoming engaged to Grandpa. But the story that she had told my sister Lauren ad nauseum was of taking maths in high school. So they asked me uh, what story I'd been getting, and I'd been getting a story about Latin class and the roots of the English language. So we realized that our grandmother had uh, told the same story over and over again, but not in repetition, but to address us as individuals. Uh, we were delighted to figure this out, to discover this pattern, um, that she had seen us uniquely, and that, in fact, she reduced herself to speak clearly to each of us. Um, clear speaking and kindred encouragement are great traits, sentimental and high-spirited traits that we will miss. 
Uh, I'd like to work outward from there, but I'll leave it to uh, your imagination and to your uh, remembrance of Betty Rennie. Uh, she had been a good wife and mother, a grandmother and a great-grandmother, and a woman of her times. Uh, but in imitation of her, I'll repeat myself. Uh, clear speaking and kindred encouragement are great traits, high-spirited traits that we will miss. Thank you. Yes, dear. From our treasured March, March breaks in Florida to our annual visits to Cullen Gardens, Grandma Rennie loved each and every one of her nine grandchildren and her eight great-grandchildren. Grandma's love of euchre was legendary. While mom, and while mom and Grandpa muddled their way through the game, occasionally winning a trick or two, Grandma and Dad dominated. Being the charitable people they are, Grandma and Dad sometimes allowed other teams to win to keep their confidence up. Grandma was strong and witty. She was always keen to pass on good advice. Many years ago, when I asked Grandma if she had Facebook, she told me, no, that stuff is for losers. <laughs> I know now that she was 100% right. <laughs> when I was very pregnant with Francis, Grandma specifically told me that, quote, having a baby was as easy as falling off a log. I don't know what kind of log she was falling off, but she was very wrong. <laughs> Grandma was always quick to crack a joke. One evening after another big Rennie family dinner, and while Grandpa was bringing around the car, she wisely told Rachel that a woman would never make her wait. I'll have her know that's not true. <laughs> have I mentioned how wise Grandma was? I have it under good authority that Grandma said I was, quote, the perfect baby. Grandma was steadfast in her beliefs. When Rachel and I spent New Year's in Florida, she insisted that we call her when leaving the bar so that she can come and escort us home. She was 83. <laughs> in our revel we, revelry, we forgot to call, but lo and behold, when we got home, there she was, sleeping in her chair, sitting up, making sure that we got in. I have such wonderful memories of my grandma, driving to Florida with our flashcards and then walkie-talkies crossing the finish line to be the first into Florida, picking oranges, trying to convince Grandma to come down to the beach, and always knowing that, Gra that the best toys were at Grandma's house. You are very loved, and you are good. And these notes from Nicole Rennie, who can't be with us today, but sent a thank you letter to my grandma instead. Thank you, Grandma Rennie, for providing a safe sanctuary for the Rennie family to share, to bond and grow in within your Port Perry and Florida homes, for raising my dad, Paul Rennie, who is one of the greatest men I have ever known. He's a bit more of a mama's boy than he cares to admit. Her words, not mine, my friend. For passing your unmatchable marble skills on to many grandchildren. For giving me your brown eyes and never failing to let me know how special they were every time we were together. For teaching me financial literacy. For example, when your dad gives you money for the corner store, pocket half the change and we ask for it back. <laughs> pocket half the change when he asks for it back. That's where that ends. That's, that was apparently her advice for financial freedom. <laughs> Steal from your father. Okay. Pardon me. And for giving me a deep appreciation of bright blue, yellow, and green floral polar fleece sweaters. 
for being the head of the heart of the Rennie family for over 70 years. And when I picture you, I see your bright smile and your classic wink. I thank you for all that you have given our family and all that you will pass on to the Rennies yet to come. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you all. It's a tough thing to do, isn't it? To stand in front of people you love and talk about somebody that's meant so very much to you. And I appreciate your words today. I know the family appreciates them as well. I heard a quote once that simply said this. It's not about how much you do, but how much love you put into what you do that counts. And when I hear those words, I'm immediately drawn to the voice of a mother, encouraging her children to do their best in all their endeavors. I'm drawn to a family looking back at all the love that they had received from the extension of that woman that they had known as their partner, their mother, their grand and great-grandmother as well. A woman like Betty, who would live a life that would show the value of love to each one who would receive from her hands and her heart to theirs. That flow of love and care would start on the 31st of December in 1929. And she'd be welcomed in the arms of her loving parents, Hector and Gladys, their New Year's gift, and no doubt one that would bring joy to the family and the family home on that eve of 1930. Her feet would join her siblings around the edges of the family table. Shirley and Frank would flank her arrival. With Shirley being the older, and I'm certain there would be lots of opportunities for her to be mom's little helper with this new bundle of joy that would have arrived. They would both know that joy when Frank would arrive. And she would know the realities of a time in history that didn't give up much to those living in those days. Yet so much has happened in those years that Betty would see and experience over her lifetime. A life that has witnessed a world war. Several localized skirmishes as well. A life that would see the advent of electricity and light bulbs in every home, the delivery of cars to every driveway the power of a computer with the computer power that once was housed in a building this size now in our hands, in our cell phones. Oh yes, they got the phone as well, as your grandparents know very well. And the cell phone in those years also, and we watched some great leaders rise and fall and some not so great leaders do the same. There were civil rights, there was Canadian citizenship, those fringe folks, the Newfoundlanders, they finally made the leap to join the rest of us here in Canada. The buildings that we would take for granted on our daily journeys in early years non-existent. And the 401 was just a dream for a long part of that 92 years. And yet they would thrive. They would do it with the strength of family to stand beside them. Those years of family and the efforts of working diligently to provide for and maintain that roof and the meals that would fill tabletops. And for Betty, those years would see her end up with a role at Bell Canada. She'd be on the admin side of the building. And in that same building would be Northern Electric, or you may know it as Nortel or Northern Telecom. And the sister companies would share that same roof. It would be very fortuitous for one young man named Mr. Ross Rennie, who happened to work for Northern Electric at the time, and I'm not sure when they were first meet, but it would be though someone had found a follow spotlight and pointed it directly at young Betty that day, encasing her lovely visage. And Ross would follow that light and find within it its brightness the most radiant woman that he had ever met in his life. Okay, he likely just said hi in a hallway. <laughs> but no matter the moment or the magic captured within, they would see them sharing an evening away from the office and together. They would enjoy a show at the Vaughn Theater. And I asked Ross what they had seen. He said, I don't remember the show, but I remember it was a great night. And I think that's the important part there, isn't it? Betty would feel very much the same. She would note for her friends and everyone that would listen across the years of her life that 
Her thoughts were at that point in time, if I don't marry him, I'd like to marry someone just like him. That's a direct quote. Betty's prayers would be answered. As Ross would ask the most vital question of his young life after their three years of dating, which it seems to me a very long time in that era, where you're like trying to save up for a ring or, or you just you wanted to make sure it was the right call. Yet the question would be asked. And Betty would gladly marry the man who would not be replaced in her heart or mind ever. And together they would stand at the altar of the Witchwood Baptist Church on the 21st day of June in 1952. It was a good thing, hon. Commit to a life of love and care side by side. And I asked if there were any tin cans tied to the back of their car as they drove away. And someone from within the family ranks who I couldn't see because I was on the phone made the comment that they hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> the honeymoon would take them to the glitz and glamour of Atlantic City and the Big Apple. And then it would be back to the realities of life in Toronto. Working hard would see them take their first home on Monarch Park. And it would be the space that they would welcome Marilyn, and then with Ross on the way, the move to Kennedy Road, to the East End. Within a few years of that move, they would welcome Paul and Doug, and the family would make their homestead on Dennis Drive in Agent Court. It would be the home for them for the next 42 years of their journey together. And with the branches of their limb filled with all the lives that they would bring to it, Betty would find her years of working outside the home now focused on loving and caring for those that she had built within it. The lives that she and Ross would bring to their hearts. And I asked the kids to tell me what she was like as a mom. And Ross Jr. noted for me that she was truly forgiving. Trust me, he's put her to the test. It was a statement from a man that likely gave her lots of reasons to ask for forgiveness in his young life. Not so many these days, I'm sure. Paul simply wanted us to know that he was her favorite. <laughs> I think we agreed on 20 bucks, right, Paul? <laughs> Yet the core of her abilities would be found in the strength that she would demonstrate. The strength that would let her have the ability to help them each achieve the goals that they had for their lives as well. Never one to want to see them limited by opportunity or gender. Betty would be the mom to encourage them to find their footing, to use it to reach their next goal. And for Marilyn, those lessons would be powerful for her and each of the young women that would follow in that vision of strength and determination that she would give them each to model and follow as a mother and a grandmother. She would cheer them on in all their achievements, whether it was from the sidelines at a game or simply by ensuring that they had the, the proper nourishment to get there. She would love the times that they would spend in the Florida sun, their home away from home. Always an inviting space for Betty to enjoy and the space where she could welcome her family over the years as well. The generations that would share in the joy of Bel Air Beach, complete with their trips to Disney, and I have no doubt that she loved them all. Because who doesn't spend time in Florida and not love the malls? Come on. But more than all of that would be the wonder of her love and care for each of their loving lives. And she could cook. I've been asked not to focus too hard on those meals. <laughs> Family favorites like spaghetti sauce with the addition of ketchup. <laughs> you know, because spaghetti sauce needs a little bit of flavor every now and then. That jello salad with the can of fruit cocktail peeking from within. I have a funny feeling that salad was the inspiration for the stapler in jello in the office. And of course, no celebration would be truly complete for Betty without her favorite, a black forest cake. Of course, those were all store bought. And while being a mother would be the joy for Betty, the roles of grand and great-grandmother would be so much more fun. 
as she could break all the rules she had set for their parents. And she would often do that with no guilt at all. Well, their parents would know the joys of shreddies and mini wheats and not the frosted ones. Oatmeal or cream of wheat is their morning staples. The grands, well, they would welcome Tony the Tiger and Toucan Sam to the breakfast table. Captain Crunch and Count Chocula, they would make an appearance, no doubt, over the years as well. They would all find space in grandma's cupboards for their visits. And while their parents would eat strawberries raw, not the grands. No, they were too good for that. She would perfectly cut each section of them for the grands, a perfect layer of sugar, bringing the natural flavor profile to life in the most wonderful of ways. It would be like sugared candy. <laughs> she would also want them to know structure. They could have an 1800 calorie breakfast if they first made their beds. There was no four-flavor Sunday without eating all their vegetables first. You know, she had to do her part. They would come fast and furiously, though. It would be about five years between when the first grandchild would arrive and the seventh. And then several still to come. And each year she would ensure that they had the annual end-of-school trip with Nana. She would pack a fantastic picnic lunch, pick them all up at the end of school and take them to enjoy the beauty of Cullen Gardens and the miniature village. The lunch would be provided as well as their end of year gifts and it would be a time that each one would hold close to their hearts as something they could look forward to each and every year. She would always have something fun for their little hands to enjoy when they were visit whether it was a basket of Fisher-Price toys or the bowling game that would entertain them just long enough for her to get dinner on the table. And they would learn to play cards with her around the edges of that table as well. When younger, they would play games like Uno and the board games that they would love, Ross's homemade version of Trouble. Only there was no pop matic bubble, just dice and marbles to move around the board, yet it would bring hours and hours of fun and enjoyment. The arrival of each new life would fill her heart with all the love that she would need it to surround it. And even with eight great grands, that heart would have space for each of their lives to share in with her own. She would love the moments that she would see herself surrounded by her family, whether that was for the simplicity of a Christmas dinner or an Easter meal, the weddings that would bring them so much joy, the showers that they would enjoy a laugh in. Not like showers, show. You got what I meant, right? Okay. And each year, their family Canada Day party at Ross and Betty's would be a highlight. It meant that Ross could take care of most of the cooking, which wasn't a bad thing, I have to imagine. It was a blessing to Betty to have you fire up the grill, no doubt. The party would move from Agent Court to Port Perry over the years, but it would never fade simply expand and allow room for more joy and more lives to be a part of it. Ross and Betty would take their retirement in port, would make the most of each of those days that they would share together. Betty would love this life. She would love the moments shared with the family around the edges of their table, playing those games of cards, or simply enjoying a cup of tea and hearing about your day. And she would love to spend time enjoying the goings-on of the day, reading her newspaper daily, the magazines that would become her monthly diet. Each month, she would look forward to receiving and clipping out the articles that would be of interest to her and passing them on to the lives that would surround her own, giving you the things that she thought you might be interested in. We all do it. It's usually over Twitter or Instagram now. But her articles would focus you on saving and financial independence and making the most of your lives. And she would love her church family, the lives that she would share in at the Agent Court Baptist Church. She would be engaged with the congregation there for decades. 
She would find those early years of her engagement seeing her participate in the leadership of the CGIT program, which for the uninitiated is Canadian girls in training, basically the Baptist version of Girl Scouts. That's how it was explained to me, so I wanted to confirm that. And as her years would pass, she would become more engaged with the older congregants as well, ensuring that they would have experiences that would bring both fun and fellowship over the years. And that faith community would be a core in their lives for 25 plus years until their move to port. And while she would not have many hobbies that would fill her days, she was too busy living her life. Her early years would see her enjoy the art of ceramics, and throughout her years, she would love to find that sewing machine and bring its workings to life to create something beautiful. Whether it was clothing for the kids or their kids, her own draperies for her house, and she would even take on the task of making Jocelyn's christening gown. She would create the pattern herself, painstakingly put all the pieces together section by section, and then taking her own wedding dress, she would take its material and she would create the most beautiful little christening gown for her beautiful little granddaughter. An heirloom to be held and shared for years to come. And she would love the moments of sheer terror as she would take Lisa under her wing and teach her how to drive. After all, no daughter-in-law of hers was going to be sitting home waiting for a husband to come and take her places. That was Betty's feminism in action, my friends. She loved those game nights with family. Never mattered which games were played. All that mattered was that they were there together, that they had come to share more moments and memories as family. She would love her family. The lives that would welcome her as a babe, holding her close to their hearts and lives, sharing their joys of building a life together with its ups and downs. And then the ones that she would call her own children, each new iteration, filling her with joy of being a mother and a wife. The arrival of the grands with their littles as well, each new milestone, another reason to take pride and strength and the love that she had passed on, that she had built into each and every one of those lives. And every mile of the last 69 years, shared with the one who would ask her to go see a show one evening over 70 years ago now, hurrah. The one who would still look at her with love each Friday night as they would sit quietly and enjoy the perfection of that Swiss chalet chicken. The joy of a chalet meal shared together. In earlier years, the kids along for the ride in the free Shirley Temples. But those years would never change, and neither would that joy of sharing those meals with her. He would be the one who would faithfully carry each of the vows that they would make in that little Baptist church until they would be completed just days ago now. I have no doubt that Betty would love this life. And all the joys that each one who shared within its steps would offer her along her journey so that when the 3rd of February would come, just days ago now, and Betty would take that final step in this life that separates our lives from those who have journeyed on, she would find peace. She would find that peace in the presence of the one she had called her God for each and every days of this journey that she would walk with us. The knowledge in her heart that as much as she had loved each of your lives, she had known just as much love in return from you. The writer of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 4, chapter 3 rather, verse 4, he states that there is a time to weep and a time to laugh. There is a time to mourn and a time to dance. The writer doesn't leave us with the thought that grief isn't to be a part of our lives because it's a natural part of the journey we walk as human beings. That we should feel any less than perfect for remembering with sadness the love that we have shared with Betty. But rather he says this, most certainly take that time to weep. 
take that time to mourn. But never lose your ability to continue to laugh or the joy that makes you dance. And I believe today that even Betty would not want any one of us to stop finding those moments of warmth and happiness that she shared with you in your lifetimes. But rather, she would be overjoyed in herself to see you find reasons to laugh and dance once more. As you too create and build those memories and those lifetimes that people will weave into their lives because of your existence. And when we come to those thoughts of Betty in the days to come, we can also think of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians in chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Where he says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. So that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus all those who have fallen asleep in him. The hope of the believer in Christ Jesus as I believe Betty was. Is that we need not grieve those who have no reason to believe in greater things to come. But like Betty and those who also hold faith in God, those who die in that faith will know the joy of sharing their eternity in the presence of Jesus in whom she had believed. This life that Betty would live would be one that was not just based in love, but one based in the strength of her convictions as well. And they would hold her firm until her last moments with us just days ago now when she would make that journey from this plane to the promised welcome to those who believe. Yet there is an honesty in our sorrow today. The loss of those we love is something that each must deal with and walk in in our own ways, in our own time. Yet for everything, that time is appointed. A time it would be appointed for Betty that just days ago on the 3rd of February would be her time. A time that would bring her relief from any of the pain that her body may have carried and endured. A time that she would be reunited with those who had shared her love, now made completely whole. She will be able to share an eternity with her parents and her family and together once more. And her value in our lives will still be felt over the course of your days to come. As long as memories last. My encouragement to you today is for those here that were witness to this wonderful life that was Betty's. That you would be witness to the lives of those that loved her as well. And that you would be standing beside them as a comfort and a support. Perhaps you'll find time to reach out to Ross and the children, the grandchildren, to let them know that your thoughts are with theirs in this significant loss to be a comfort and a care alongside them as time passes, when they may need the warmth of your smile or your embrace, or just to know that Betty's life is cherished and valued by your own. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And let us not be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare to make our way from the chapel today, bring our formal time of remembrance to a close, I would like to share with you a final reading and a song that Betty loved. They're dedicated to Betty's memory today from her loving Ross and the family. The poet writes these words. Should you go first and I remain to walk this road alone, I'll live in memory's garden, dear, with happy days we've known. In spring, I'll wait for roses red when faded the lilacs blue. In early fall, when brown leaves fall, I'll catch a glimpse of you. Should you go first and I remain for battle to be fought, Each thing you've touched along the way will be a hallowed spot. I'll hear your voice, I'll see your smile, though blindly I may grow. But the memory of your helping hand will buoy me on with hope. 
Should you go first and I remain, one thing I'll have you do. Walk slowly down that long, long path that I might follow you. I want to know each step you take, for I may take the same. But someday, down that lonely road, you'll hear me call your name.